we are ready to dive into today. So let's turn our attention to what God has to say to us in Hebrews chapter 8. So turn with me. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 12. This is another section, I think, of relatively short. Six verses isn't bad, right? Um, And we are going to be wrapping up chapter 8 here in one of the most critical passages in the entire book of Hebrews about the new covenant. Now, you'll recall if you were here last week, which I know most of you were, last week we reiterated what the writer of the book of Hebrews has been saying all along, which is that you and I have a more glorious high priest than any Old Testament high priest could ever be, right? And you recall last week that the high priest Jesus does three things that every high priest does, but he does it better, right? He offers a better sacrifice himself, the perfect sacrifice, a better location, right? He goes into the heavenly places himself where God is, and then a better result, right? He sat down, the work was finished and complete. That all makes Christ the greater, more wonderful high priest. And that all leads to verse 6, because here's what's going to happen. In verse 6, our author is going to say, Basically, therefore, if Christ is better, then the new covenant which he brings is better. In other words, he's going to say, if Christ is the better high priest, then when he inaugurates a new arrangement, a new covenant, a new contract, if you will, with God's people, it's going to be more glorious, more wonderful, better than anything that's gone before. So today is all about the new covenant and what it's like. And I can tell you this, this is going to be a thick one today. Okay, you're like, you know, you think, well, can we just ease into the semester a little bit and have a couple lightweight ones? No, last week we jumped right in, and we're going to jump right in. This is going to be heavy hitting today, so you need to sort of get that caffeine rolling if you don't have it, because we're going to go in, and we're going to go in hard. So this is going to be the deep end of the pool. A lot of stuff about covenants today, but it's going to be wonderful, rich, meaty stuff. So let's listen and hear what God's going to say to us, starting in verse 6. But as it is... Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better. There's that word, by the way, better. We're going to come back to that, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, behold, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law and to their minds, and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. This is a wonderful passage. What it reminds us of today is that the glories of the new covenant, which you and I are enjoying right now, have been longed for and anticipated for generations in the past. People long to live in the day you and I live in. And it's an amazing privilege to be where we are. So we want to really digest that and soak that in today. So let's pray and ask God to bless this passage to us. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for a new text. Lord, we're grateful for a new day. Uh, sun is shining. Lord, you give us great weather today. We're grateful for it. Lord, give us your light also on this word that you may impress it upon our heart. Lord, may we leave with a renewed appreciation today that you have been merciful toward us. You remember our sins no more. And Lord, you have done something new and wonderful in Christ. So we commit this to you in his name. Amen. Okay, I want to begin this morning by taking you back in time for a moment. For those of you that are married, I want to take you to your wedding day. I want you to think back, whatever number of years you need to think back, could be five years, could be 25 years, to that moment, and you know the moment, where you were standing there, probably in front of a a congregation at a church, 
looking into the eyes of your spouse, and you did something that our world today is utterly confused and perplexed by. You made promises. You exchanged vows. You said to your husband, to death, to us, part. And not only did you make promises to him, but then he made promises to you. You exchanged vows. You exchanged promises. You, in a sense, entered into, not in a sense, really did enter into an agreement, even a legally binding agreement, a contract, if you will. And not only did you do that, but you actually even had symbols of that contract. You exchanged probably Knowing our tradition in our day, you probably have a ring on your finger now that reminds you of that moment where you stood and you made those vows and you engaged in those exchanges and you have signs and symbols to remind you that you did that. Now, when you think back on that day, I bet there's a word you probably don't use to describe it, but you did enter into it that day and you may not even realize it. That day you entered into a covenant. That's effectively what marriage is, right? In fact, that's what a covenant is. A covenant is simply some sort of arrangement, some sort of contract, some sort of obligation exchange between two parties where there's vows and there's promises, and there's usually signs, in this case rings, associated with those promises. And when you enter into that covenant arrangement, you may not realize that that really reflects something divine. And when I say it reflects something divine, I don't mean it reflects something divine just because God sort of blesses your marriage, I hope he does, or that you did it in front of God. Well, that's part of what I mean. But what I mean is that God also enters into covenants. God also enters into contractual obligations, and he does it with his people. Or you could say he does it with his church, right? In fact, in a way, what you can see about covenants is it's really God getting married, in a sense. The Lord is the groom. The church is his bride. And what he does is he gets together with his bride and he has a contract, an arrangement, what we call a covenant. And there's promises exchanged and there's vows made and there's signs given. And God says, I will do these things and I will bless you and I will I will do these things and I will keep you and I will save you and I will deliver you. And all those things are what we call a covenant. And what you may not realize is that the entire Bible, if you're going to understand the entire Bible from front to back, it's really about that reality. It's about God's marriage, if you will, his covenant relationship with his people, where he says to his people, I will be your God, and you will be my people, and we will be together, like, in a sense, a husband and wife are, right? But, of course, here's the tragedy of the whole thing in the biblical story, is that God's marriage, if you will, to Israel doesn't turn out so well. In fact, we're going to learn in our account today that his marriage to Israel, in effect, ends Not because God didn't keep his promises, but because Israel didn't keep hers. And what I mean by that is that we're going to learn that that old covenant, that covenant that God made with Moses on Mount Sinai with Israel after he delivered them out of Egypt, that marriage, if you will, faltered. And the reason it did is not because God was faithless. No, he's always faithful. But basically what happened in the Old Testament is his bride ran off with other gods. Have you ever realized before that God was cheated on? That God was married to a woman, quote-unquote, a a people of God that was unfaithful to him? Now, what would you expect a God to do in a a situation like that or any particular? You say, well, I'm done with you, right? That's it. It's over. We're never going to have a relationship again. That's not what God does. Here's the the good news you're going to get today in this passage. God says, okay, the old covenant was broken. The old covenant faltered. The old covenant had had problems. We'll come back and define what those are in a moment. But guess what? God doesn't give up. God doesn't stop. God doesn't end it there. He says, I'm going to make a new covenant. I'm going to make a new covenant with my people, Israel, and I'm going to pursue her again. I'm going to go after her again. I'm going to refresh that again. And guess what? This new covenant is going to be wonderful and glorious, and this is going to do all the things I promised to do. That story I just laid out for you is the whole passage today. It is the story of God's covenant relationships with his people. And so there's two stages to it, right? There's an old covenant that was broken, if you will, and there's a new covenant that's restored. And that new covenant is that great news about Jesus Christ saving us from our sins. And so this is what we're going to learn today. We're going to learn about what covenants are, and we're going to learn about what the new covenant is like and how it's different from the old. 
This is a lot to pack into one lesson, right? There's going to be all kinds of fascinating theological, biblical timeline issues today in this passage. It's going to be wonderful. So let's take a look at the outline and see where we're going to go here together. You'll see in Roman number one there, the first thing I want to do is I want to just dive into covenants for a moment. Just sort of a little prepper to our whole passage today. I want to give you sort of a quick theological tour of what covenants are, and we'll dive into that and talk about understanding covenants better. And then in the second Roman numeral there, we're going to dive into the glories of the new covenant. And there we're going to walk through that passage verse by verse. We're going to talk about the promise of the new covenant. What was wrong with the old covenant? What's new about the new covenant, right? This is always a question. If there's a new covenant, well, what's new about the new covenant? It's called new. What's new? And we're going to talk about that. And we're going to just see afresh the structure of the way God sets things up. What we're going to take away today is this reality. When we talk about God's salvific work, how he saves and redeems his people, you're going to learn that, that the best way to understand that is within a biblical structure called covenant, okay? We tend to think of it abstractly, sort of vaguely, generally. God just saved me, or he loved me, or he, he gave himself for me. And, and those are all true things, but, but they're kind of amorphous, right? There's nothing there to really latch them onto. What I want you to see today is that the, the structure for understanding your salvation is actually the structure of the covenant, right? It's the same way you understand your own marriage, and it's the way God understands his union, his inseparable union with his people. Okay, let's dive into the first Roman numeral, understanding covenants. There's a word here that po pops up in this passage numerous times called covenant, diatheke in the Greek. I'll put it there for those of you that care <laughs> or want to know or want to try your skills out in reading Greek. Some of you have had Greek in here because I know you've sat in a few seminary classes. Diatheke is really the um, Greek term for covenant. It's berit in the Old Testament Hebrew, and this is a word that occurs throughout the entire Bible. And if we were to define covenant this morning, just as a simple way, I've kind of already done it for you. Think of covenant like a contract. Think of it like, a, like, a, like, a, like a, uh, some sort of a treaty, if you will. Some sort of arrangement or legally binding uh, sort of union between two parties. Here's what's interesting. When we look in the Bible, we see not only that God makes covenants with his people, but we also say, we see in the Bible that people make covenants with people. Okay? And one of the good examples of what a covenant is in the Bible is that nations make covenants with nations, okay? Um, and we use a term for this in the modern day called a treaty, okay? A, na a treaty is just simply a covenant. It's, a it's one nation's relationship to another nation. Here's how we're going to relate to each other. Here's what you're going to do as your nation. Here's what I'm going to do. And usually there's a bigger nation that's protecting and in one sense delivering a weaker nation in the Bible. Regardless of how you slice it up, there is a legal, binding, contractual relationship here which is really what covenants are like. And so you can think of it as a contract or a treaty or so on. Um, now, whenever I mention that, you know, people think in their minds, wow, that sounds so sterile, doesn't it? It sounds so legal. It sounds so impersonal. Do I really want to think about my relationship with God in terms of a covenant when it sounds like I'm just signing a document, like it's a, a formal like, contractual arrangement I'd have when I'm selling my house? Is that really what I want to do? Now, here's what I want you to realize, is that there is a real legal dimension to covenants that we need to absorb, because we tend to sort of put them all in sort of feely terms in our world. And you need to realize there is a legal, contractual, binding obligation part of the covenant. And you may think that sounds sterile, not if God is bound to it. If God is faithful to it, you're like, I'm glad there's obligations, and I'm glad there's promises, and I'm glad he's keeping them, because I need him to keep them, right? But here, don't make this mistake. Don't think, though, that it's only legal and contractual. There is a relational, emotional, uh, and uh, affectional, if you will, part of the covenant as well. And this is why marriage is such a good example, right? When you get married, there's two extremes that happen. Some people say, oh, I don't need to get married because that's just a legal contractual piece of paper. Who cares? Let's just love each other and live together. God says, no, you need, you need that legal, contractual, official dimension of it. But then there's another extreme marriage where they think ma marriage is just legal and contractual and official and there's no real affection, right? Both are not the biblical vision for marriage and both are not the biblical vision for what God wants. Contracts and covenants in the biblical sense have both a legal dimension and a relational dimension. When you got married on your wedding day, you, you, you left with two things that were true. One is you were legally bound. Like it or not, you were. But also when you left, you left with a sense, I hope, <laughs> I won't interview each of you, with real affection and love and joy over the relationship God gave you. Both those things are true. And that's the way covenants work. 
You can also see there in the bullet point, covenants have terms and conditions in the Bible. They have blessings and curses. And here's the thing that's interesting is they also have signs. In the Bible, God, when he makes a covenant, does all these things. I want you to think about Moses going up on Mount Sinai and receiving the Ten Commandments. That is the quintessential Old Testament covenant event. That is the inauguration of what our writer calls the Old Covenant. And when you think about it, there are all kinds of stipulations and contractual obligations in those documents that God gave Moses. And you know this because you've read Deuteronomy and you've read Leviticus, you've read Numbers, you've read the book of Exodus, and you've seen all that. And then you get bored with it and think, wow, there's a lot of legalese here. Can't we get on to something else? But it was all there. And God made promises there and there were obligations and there was blessings and curses if the covenant was kept or broken. But here's another thing God did in Mount Sinai is he gives signs. I'm going to give you a sign of my covenant arrangement, my pledge to you. That sign, there was two of them in the Old Testament. There was circumcision, and there was also the Passover meal. Right? Those were the signs that God's people could always look to to say, ah, God has pledged himself to us as our God. You know, that's why we wear wedding, wedding rings. I can remember when I was little as a child, uh, when, when my kids were little, um, not when I was little, but my kids were little, I'd tuck them in at night in bed, and you know, they just noticed things about the parents, and they're like, what's, why do you wear that ring? And what's that ring? You know, when your kid's two or three, they don't really know why you wear a ring. I'm like, well, this is the ring that mom gave me on our wedding day. It's like, well, why do you wear it? Um, you know, is, is there a sense that I'm wearing it so that everyone knows I'm taken, you know? Is that, is that the reason? That's kind of what the world will tell you. That's not why we wear it. Maybe one reason, perhaps, but it's not really the reason why we wear rings. Why we wear rings is not so much for people out there, although that's part of it. I wear a ring for me, Right? What do I see when I look down at this ring in the middle of the day? I I look at it and I say, someone has pledged their love to me. Someone has said that they will never leave me and that they will always be there for me. I look at that ring and I'm encouraged and I'm I'm, I'm reassured, right? I'm established. It it helps me. It it lifts me up when I see it because I'm like, oh, there was a moment in time when, uh, when, when someone said, I will love you for the rest of my life and I will always be there. And this is a sense of I look at that ring it reassures me and encourages me in that promise. Now, think about it. For that. The symbol doesn't make me married. Right? I could take my ring off right now if I could get it off my finger. If I get it off my finger, it doesn't make me unmarried, but it does remind me that I'm married. And that's what signs do in covenants. They're, they're contractual reminders. And they're, they should be encouraging to you, right? They should say to you, you've been loved by somebody. When you, when you, when you see baptism in the church or you partake of the Lord's Supper, the signs of the new covenant, you should remind yourself that God has pledged himself to me. He loves me. I belong to him, just like a wedding ring would do. Those are what covenants are, excuse me, are in the Bible. Now, look at point B there under Roman number one. Here's another thing I want you to see. The history of the Bible, therefore, is a history of God's covenants. I can tell you one of the most common questions I get all the time in churches uh, in my church and many of the different churches I, I'm in and out of all the time, people ask me all the time, how can I get a big picture of the whole Bible at once? And the reason they ask me that question is because most of the people, when they study the Bible, they study a little bitty passage, right? Not that different than what we do in here. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with taking five or six verses and really unpacking it, right? But you know what happens in your Christian life is that 20 years go by and all you've really learned is this little 10 verses and these little five verses and those little four verses and these little six verses. And you know what people always want to know? Well, how does it all fit together? You ever want to know the big picture of the Bible, the overall structure of the whole biblical story? If you want to know that, the answer lies in covenants. Okay? This is how to understand the entire biblical story. Let me just point out a few things under this that I want you to recognize first bullet point there. Ever since the fall, God has always saved his people through what we call as theologians and as biblical scholars the covenant of grace. This is just language we use to describe this covenant. The covenant of grace is just a way of describing the way God saves sinful people. Ever since Adam and Eve fell, here's what I want you to realize, and if you were in my Roman study, you know this because we learned this really clearly. Some of you were not in there, but most of you were. Throughout the entire history of, of uh, God's creation after the fall, people are always saved by God in the exact same way. People think in their minds, oh, the Old Testament you're saved by works, the New Testament you're saved by grace. Nuh-uh. There's only one way to be saved as a sinner, and that is by grace through a Redeemer who saves you from your sins. In the Old Testament, they look forward to it. We in the New Covenant look back to it as Jesus already accomplished it. But make no mistake about it, all throughout the Bible, there's one unified covenant of grace that everyone's saved the same way. 
You know how we prove this in the book of Romans? Is because the quintessential example that Paul uses in Romans 4 as a believer in Jesus was who? Come on, guys, you know this. Romans, right? I heard it. Abraham. Think about what Paul's going to do. Paul says, I'm going to prove justification by faith in Jesus to you. And here's my example, Abraham. You're like, what? He, li- he lived 2,000 years before me, before Jesus. How is that going to be an example of a believer in Jesus? Ah, but Jesus thought Abraham believed in him, right? Jesus said, Abraham looked forward to my day. He saw it and was glad. Make no mistake about it. There's one overarching covenant of grace. Everybody from the fall of Adam and Eve to the present is always saved, not by works, not by merit, but by a Savior that was to come. Here's the other thing I want you to see, though, if you're going to understand covenants, is that the covenant of grace comes in stages. This is the biblical unfolding. There's three main stages I mentioned here, but you need to understand this because this is the way covenants work. There's what you might call the Abrahamic covenant, which is sort of the first time we see the covenant of grace fully articulated. Then the next phase is the Mosaic covenant, which our author is calling the Old Covenant, where God establishes a formal relationship with Israel. And then finally and thirdly, it's the New Covenant. So these are sort of anchor points in your whole biblical story for the way God operates and works. And here's the lesson to see here is God does not reveal his salvation plan all in one fell swoop. He does it in stages progressively over time, little by little. And each of these covenants, we won't do it today, obviously, but each of these covenants has their own unique little steps and stages. But what we're going to see today is that our author is going to contrast the old covenant under Moses and the new covenant you're in now. And it's that new covenant you're in now, which is the most glorious manifestation of all God's promises in Christ. You live, and you probably don't even realize this, and we all need to be reminded about it, you live what the Bible calls in the last days. You live at the end of the ages. You live in a time when the culmination of God's promises have been seen and realized in the person of Jesus. You know what we rarely do? We rarely reflect on the blessings of that. In fact, we ought to do that for just a second. What do you think, and I open this up to you, what, what are some of the blessings and benefits and privileges, if you will, that we have at the end of the process? Do you realize there's no other covenant after us? The only thing left on the stage after, after this period of time is Christ returning. There's not going to be a new, new covenant. It's not going to be a third covenant here. It's, this is it. You're, you're at the culmination of the ages. What, what blessings and privileges did that give us that we need to reflect upon this morning? Open it up to you. Yeah. Ah, oh, yes. We have the whole word of God. We got the complete biblical revelation handed to us. You realize that most believers in history did not have access to that, right? For one, a lot of believers in history couldn't even read, so they, even if they had it, they couldn't have read it. But they didn't even have it because it hadn't been written yet. We have that ble- benefit. What else do we have? being at the end of the whole process here. Yep. Yes, and we're going to unpack that today. We have the Holy Spirit in the fullest measure poured out on the church completely. That is, a, that is a thing that we don't even realize how important that is. The reason the Great Commission can happen is because of that. The gospel is going to go forward with power because of the power of the Holy Spirit. What else is a benefit or a privilege of living in, in this time period? Yes. 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 Yeah, it's like, it's like being in a fog. It's like being in, in the Old Testament, you could see things, but they weren't clear. They were foggy, they were difficult. It'd be like, it's like driving at night versus driving in the daytime. Okay, when you drive at night, you can see things, you got some help with your headlights, but things are difficult in the daytime, everything's clear, right? That's the difference between the Old and the New Testament is that there's a sense of greater clarity about what God's been up to and how it would end up. Other things that you think about, yeah. Yes, here's the thing about the Old. If you lived in the Old Testament, you know what your, your hope was hinging on? That, that Jesus would come. But what is our hope? hinged on that jesus has come think about the difference in that it's already finished it's already done it's absolutely complete we can look back looking back is easier than looking forward in some ways right because it's assured and finished one of the things i want you to realize today before we even jump into the new covenant more fully is just realize where you are in the scope of the timeline right you are in a privileged wonderful glorious spot 
No one could have ever imagined the glories of the resurrection in the Old Testament. You get to witness that, not in the sense that you lived in the first century, but you get to be here after the fact, and you get to see the testimony of that taking place. The 2,000 years of church history, God's faithfulness, and so many more things we could list here. You live at the intersection of the ages, and I want you to see that here under this first point. Okay, let's look at the second Roman numeral. This is where we dive more fully into the glories of the new covenant. And here's where we're going to walk through verses 8 to the end of the chapter. And we're just going to go sort of line by line here and talk about the glories of the new covenant. And as we do this, you have to realize, of course, that what our author is doing is laying out the glories of the new covenant by actually citing a passage from the old covenant. Here's an interesting little fact, right? He's citing from Jeremiah 31. From verse 8 on is a long, extended quote from the book of Jeremiah, and he lays it out for you. And what our author is basically doing is he's taking this Jeremiah 31 quote about the new covenant, and he's applying it to the church. He's applying it to the age you're in with Jesus Christ as Savior and saying, this is all now true for you. So what we're going to do as we walk through these verses is go back to an Old Testament passage effectively, right? And learn what the nature of the new covenant is. So let's unpack that sort of line by line here. And let's start under that Roman number with A. First, the new covenant was promised long ago. Look at verse 8. For he finds fault with them when he says, I'm going to come back to the fault language in a minute, but I want you to focus on verse 8 in terms of the quote from Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, when you hear that, you think, well, I don't really know what to make of that statement. Why would that have been so meaningful? Ah, but you have to realize that when God uttered that statement, Jeremiah, things were in utter shambles in Israel. The, old, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were split. Exile was on the horizon. Idolatry was rampant. Things had fallen apart. The remnant left, the people who really loved God, were like, God, do something. And God steps on the scene here with Jeremiah 31 and says, I will. I'm going to renew my covenant. I'm going to go after my bride again. I'm going to redo this marriage, if you will, with a new covenant that's, that's coming. And you notice this language is very prophetic. Behold, the days are coming. This is that great and glorious promise that I have not forgotten you. I'm not leaving you behind. I will come and I will set all things right with a new covenant. So this is, this is that great, grand anticipation that promise that God made, and Israel needed it badly at this point because of the situation they were in in the book of Jeremiah. Here's the other thing I want you to notice about verse 8 that's key, though, is notice who he makes the new covenant with. Here's what God is not doing. God doesn't go to Israel and say, well, I'm going to make a new covenant, but it's not going to be with you. I'm going to go find a new group of people out there, um, and I'm going to call it the church, and we'll go do it with that. No, notice what he does. The, the new covenant here is with Israel and Judah. He's going back to his wayward bride, and he says, we're going we're gonna to hit the reset button effectively, and we're going to have a new covenant with you. Now, if I were to ask you all today, are you part of the new covenant in Jesus Christ? Everyone would say yes. But what you may not realize is the implications of saying yes. If you say you're part of the new covenant, the implications are then that means you're part of the new Israel. And this is one of the key development points I want you to see in the whole timeline of God's story here is that those who believe in jesus christ are counted as part of his covenant people namely israel you are the new israel by virtue of believing in jesus we cover this extensively in the book of romans we actually covered this quite a bit in the first half of hebrews and so i won't repeat it all here but this is a sense of your identity right your identity is that you've been engrafted in romans 11 you've been engrafted into the tree of abraham Remember what Paul says in, Romans, or in Galatians 3? Anybody who believes in Jesus is a son or daughter of Abraham. Not ethnically, of course, but spiritually. What I want you to realize then is there's a grand degree of continuity here. You are, in one sense, put inside the promises of Israel. It's no longer a physical nation, of course. You're no longer a political entity, but you are in every way the true Israel that God intended. There's a continuity then between the people of God. God does not abandon his people and start over with a completely different set. He renews those people uh, in the promises of Christ. So this is step one in our understanding, is understanding that you now are part of those promises. So the promises that God made to Israel and Judah are promises he made to you and me, right? We are now the beneficiaries of that from long ago. Okay, let's look at point B, though, understanding the new covenant. If you're going to talk about the new covenant, point B, what was wrong with the old? Ah, now we're getting to the nub of it. 
here's where we start really getting into the weeds of the theological meat of this passage. If you need a new covenant, what does that mean about the old? Then the old must be faulty. If the old wasn't faulty, why would you need a new? And this is exactly our author's case. So what exactly was wrong with the old covenant? And by the old covenant, again, we mean that arrangement that God made with Moses on Mount Sinai with the nation of Israel. What was wrong with that? Well, there's two things that were faulty about it. And you can see there in your notes what they are. First, problem number one, the old covenant itself was faulty. I want you to look back up at verse 7 for a moment. Back up one verse. For if that first covenant also known as the Old Covenant, had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Implication, that Old Covenant was faulty. What does that mean? Here's where people can lose their way theologically. Some read a passage like verse 7 and they think, oh, well then the Old Testament order was bad, and it was wrong, and it was even sinful, and by golly, I'm glad to be done with that. Is that what our author's doing? There's a big misunderstanding out there in the history of the church of some that disparage the Old Testament as almost faultless in the sense that it's sinful and wrong and even evil and contradictory to everything else. That is not what our author is doing here. There's a very famous heretic in the history of the church called Marcion. This is what Marcion believed. Marcion thought the Old Testament should just be cut off and sort of effectively burned away. And we're like, no, that's not what he means here. What does he mean by faulty then? You can see what I mean in that lower bullet point. It just simply means the Old Covenant could not accomplish what it looked forward to. It cannot accomplish what it promised. To put it a different way, to say the Old Testament was faulty as a covenant, or the Old Covenant was faulty as a covenant, is to simply say it was provisional. Okay? It, sh- it simply means it was temporary. It simply means it was looking forward to the real thing later. It was not the real thing. It was looking forward to the real thing. So think about the animal sacrifices as an example of this. Is there something sinful or wrong about animal sacrifices? No. But they are provisional, and they can't actually take away sin. And as much as they cannot actually take away sin, then they are faulty. It can't get it done. So here's the first point I want you to see about the Old Covenant. The reason you needed a new one is because the Old Covenant just couldn't get it done. It just couldn't get the job done. It couldn't actually save you from your sins. Why? Because the blood of bulls and goats can't do that. You need a real Savior to save you. So again, that doesn't mean the Old Testament is sinful, wrong, or evil. It just means it's incomplete or provisional or temporary. Ah, but that's not the only thing that was wrong. Flip your notes over. Look at the second problem. The second problem with the Old Covenant and why I need a new is that the Old Covenant people were faulty. I want you to realize that the problem with the Old Covenant was twofold. There was a problem with the covenant itself and that it was just provisional, but there's also a, co- a problem with the people. There's a problem with Israel. Look at verses 8 and 9, and you'll see what I'm talking about here. Verse 8, for he finds fault with them, with Old Testament Israel. And what was the fault that he finds with them? We see it in verse 9. This new covenant will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers on on that day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. Ah, here's the nuts and bolts of it. What you realize then is that the problem with the Old Covenant people was that they simply broke it. They were idolaters. They ran off with other gods. They were a cheating spouse, effectively. What you realize then is that God's motivation here in the New Covenant is because Israel ran off with idols and broke her wedding vows, effectively. Do you realize that God himself knows more than we ever realize what it means to be rejected? And I don't mean just that Jesus on earth in his earthly ministry knew rejection, because he did, by the way. Loneliness, betrayal, rejection. But the God of heaven goes to a people of Israel and gives everything to her and loves her and pledges himself to her, and off she goes. See ya. Like I said at the very beginning of our time, what would you expect someone to do in that situation? Here's the incredible thing is that God understands what it's like to be rejected, and this shows you the heart of God, right? God is a God who pursues even when we wander, right? He's a God that pursues even when we flee. Now, I want to pause on this for a moment today because I think that this this is a a key point for us. How, How should this really encourage us today to see this reality that even our God 
understands the rejection. And even our God responds with perseverance and pursuit in the midst of it. Let's just think about that for a moment together. And here's where I welcome your comments. How should that encourage us today to see that our Lord even knows what it's like to, in a sense, have a broken covenant and an unfaithful spouse? All kinds of things here that should encourage us about this. Yes. 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 In other words, we look at our culture that rejects us. We can have people in relationships that reject us. And we can think, oh, th- this is something unprecedented in life and something I don't know what to do to handle. And we can look to God and say, God knows what it's like to be rejected. That's a great point. What else, what else can we learn from this? How else can, should we be encouraged in the midst of this? Yes. Okay, say more about that. What do you mean? Ah, yes. Yeah, so here's, here's an interesting thing, is that if you ever wonder whether God's going to stick with you, there's, this is the passage for you, right? You think God's going to abandon you? Well, golly, I mean, even Israel ran off with his other idols, and God says, well, let's do this again, and he goes after her again. Here's the amazing thing about the story of the Bible. The, the story of the Bible is about a God who's an, an unrelenting pursuer of those he loves. He will not stop. He will not quit. He will not cease. He goes to his own, literally, his own death in Jesus Christ to win his bride. And then God's people say, well, I'm not sure you really love me. And you're like, what? Wait, have you been reading the Bible? Now, I get it, because we're all, we're all fallible, fallen human beings that have doubt in our hearts, but I think what you need to take away from this passage today is that, that doubt, although we all struggle with it, this is the cure for it, right? Is to realize that you have a God that is not just bent over backwards, but gone every extra mile, done every extra thing, given more grace than is imaginable to pursue a, a wayward bride, his people, to love her so he can be with her. That should give us great assurance that God is not going to abandon us. God is always going to be with us if he's that kind of God. Here's the other application I think that we could take away from this, is it also is a lesson for how we treat people who abandon us, right? Is that we pursue them, we look for them, we go after them. And this is a critical part of the equation. This is, I think, one of the heart and souls of this passage, is that God would even have a new covenant, is what I want you to see. The amazing thing about grace is that it exists at all. Okay? There's no deserving party here. It's not like God says, well, you guys didn't mean it, or you've you're, you got some good remnants left in you. No, they, they had completely, God says, it doesn't matter. This isn't about works, this is about grace. I'm going to go and we're going we're gonna to do this in the new covenant order. Okay, so that leads us to point C then. What's new about the new covenant? What has changed about the new covenant? Here's where we come to verses 10 through 12. As you can see there in your notes, a good way to remember what's new about the new covenant is, is what I call the three Ps here, okay? And you can, you'll have your notes, of course, but you can also tuck this away mentally in your brain as sort of as a theological grid. What's new about the new covenant? New power, new people, new priest. And it's really the first one I want to focus on. I'm going to say something about the other two as well, but it's really the fir- first one I want to focus on. And that is, in the new covenant, what you get is new power. I want you to notice verse 10 with me as we walk through this passage. God goes on to say this, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. In other words, here's the new thing he's going to do. Get ready for it. I will put my law into their minds and write them on their hearts. We'll put it in their minds and write it on their hearts. Now, why is that new? Here's the reality. In the old covenant order, under Moses, it very much was a stage of the covenant of grace that had a lot of externals. Okay? It was externally driven for the most part. A lot of ritual, but also a lot of law poured on God's people. And there are so many externals that what you end up in a situation with in Old Testament Israel is a sense in which people are laboring to keep the law and live out these rituals, and religion becomes this external matter with no internal dimension to it, no heart to it. And I can tell you this, if you try to keep God's law merely as an external, merely as something outside with no real heart in it, you will have a very difficult time in your religious life. In fact, and effectively, not only will you be a poor law keeper, but you're also going to turn into a Pharisee, because that's what Pharisees ultimately have to do, just crack the whip, to get people to obey, both themselves and others, because there's no heart in it. It's all external and behavioral. 
Here's what's interesting, though, and this is a hunch I have, and I think this is true. I think there's a sense in which we like our religion as externals. I think there's a sense in which people in our, in our fallen self actually prefer religious activity to be f- filled with externals. There's a reason for that, because externals are measurable. Externals can be, boxes can be checked. Externals can be measured. And more importantly, you can measure your externals against other people's, right? Look at all the things I've done and all the things you've done, and I've come out ahead. I think people inherently want religion to be about external performance. Here's the interesting thing about the new covenant, though. God says, ah, but I'm going to do something different. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to change who you are, and I'm going to write my law on your heart, and therefore when you keep it, you're going to keep it differently than you kept it before. You're going to keep it from the heart out of love and affection for me. And what's sort of embedded into this, this, this new power is that, is that and, and I can't draw these things out from, for time reasons, but linked, all these different biblical links here, is that what God is promising here is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. What God is saying here when he says, I'm going to write my law on your heart, is that he's going to pour out the Holy Spirit in a new and fresh way on his people. And I've given you examples there in your notes from Ezekiel 36 and Acts 2 and so on, where these things are promised and fulfilled. And this tells us something, that the new covenant is different because when we keep the law, we keep it from the heart and from internal affections. I want you to know something very interesting, though, about the, the contrast between the Old and the New Covenant here, is that the Old and the New Covenant both care about law-keeping. Don't make the mistake. This is really important to think Old Testament cared about law-keeping, New Covenant doesn't. No, 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 no. Both care about law-keeping. The question isn't whether God still cares about you obeying Him. The question is how you obey Him. Do you obey Him from the heart, or do you obey Him on the basis of external performance? Now, to drive this home, here's an illustration I'll give you that I think really captures the, the difference between internal and external. And, and sticking with the husband-wife analogy I started with, this is an illustration. Imagine that your husband gets home from work at the end of the day and walks in with flowers. And when he walks in with flowers to present them to you, here's what he says. He says, you know what? I've been reflecting lately that, that uh, you know, if I'm going to be a good husband, there's certain duties that go with that. Um, and... Uh, so I wrote out those duties of what a good husband should do, and I realized that one of those duties is that every, every four and a half weeks I should give you flowers. And so I put it on the calendar, and today it beeped on my calendar, and so on the way home I stopped by the flower store and I picked up these flowers, and so now I've done my duty as a husband, and, and here, here they are. Now, on one level you could say, but your husband brought you flowers, isn't that great? But I know what you would say. You would say, wow, gee, thanks for checking the box, right? <laughs> thanks for the you know, external performance measurement. Thanks for going through the motions. Thanks for doing your duty. Now I want you to notice a different scene. Your husband comes home with flowers one day, and he presents them to you, and he says to you, I couldn't stop thinking about you all day. I realize what a great and wonderful woman you are, and that after these many years of marriage, I'm so thankful for you. And I just had to find a way to show how much I love you. And I couldn't stop thinking about you all day, so on the way home, I just couldn't help myself. I had to swing by the store and pick these flowers up just to show you how much I love and care for you because it really is something that that, that, that I recognize is how special you are to me. And your husband gives you these flowers and says, I love you. Now, I want you to notice in both instances, the exact same act was performed. A husband gave his wife flowers. But then again, it isn't the same act, is it? It's the same act, but then it isn't the same act because God cares about the heart of the act. And what you realize is, is the difference between the Old and the New Covenant is effectively the poured out spirit in your heart means that now you are empowered to obey God in the way you always should have obeyed him, right? Because you love him out of affection and not out of duty, not out of just checking a box. And here's the trick of it all. That, those kinds of people with the power of the spirit in their heart, the law written on their heart, are the kind of people that obey God better. We think in our minds that legalistic duty law-keeping creates more obedience. It doesn't. Heart-driven affection creates real obedience. Here's the ironic outcome of the New Covenant. In the New Covenant, you have more grace, in effect, and you have even better obedience. We think that if you have more grace, you have less obedience. God says, no, 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 I'm going to pour out my spirit, and I'm going to show you all this grace, and when I do, actually, it's going to generate even more. 
We've got to flip on our head what we think creates good. We think obedience is created by cracking the whip. No, obedience is created by getting a new heart. And what God's going to do is he's going to rearrange the relationship in such a way by the pouring out of the Spirit in a fresh manner so that people obey as they always were intended to obey. So don't make the mistake to think that the Old Covenant's law and the New Covenant's not. Both have law in them, but they have a whole different thing behind it, and that's what makes the difference, right? It's the affection for God because he loved us and poured out his grace on us in Christ. Now, there's other P's here. Let me just say a quick word about them. There's also a new people, verse 11. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they should all know me, from the least to the greatest. What this effectively is hinting at is, first of all, a reunification of God's people, Israel and Judah coming together, but it's also hinting at what you might call a revival among God's people. In the new covenant, there's going to be revival. And what I mean by that is there's going to be more people in the midst of God's people that actually believe. Now, you might think, well, that's odd. In the old covenant, were there a lot of people in the old covenant that were in it externally and didn't believe? Yes. Here's what we have to realize is that there were many chunks of time under Old Testament Israel where they were inside the old covenant order, part of the nation of Israel, and they didn't believe. They were just not believers. Now, that can still happen in the New Testament time. We talked about that in Hebrews with apostasy. But what you have is a greater, fuller revival among God's people. So that now you're not having to sort of convert God's people. You can, in one sense, know that the people around you are saved because of the greater revival that's due to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So there's a, there's a new people, if you will, that really do love God. And then, of course, thirdly here, a new priest. Look at verse 12. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And how do you have that? Because you have a priest where the sins are fully and finally forgiven. By the way, there's a, if, you, if you mark in your Bibles, there's a great thing to mark. I will remember their sins no more. You ever had something that you did five years ago that you really regretted, and the person you did it to just keeps bringing it up and throwing it back in your face? <laughs> ever had that happen? And you're like, I thought we got over this. I said I was sorry for that. I thought you forgave me for that. And they just keep bringing it up and just shoving it in your face as sort of a way to put you down. And they don't forget. Here's the amazing thing is God said, I will remember your sins no more. Not because I don't care about sin, but because Jesus is enough to cover it. The thing that makes the new covenant great is you have a new priest to get it done, okay? So you have a new power in the Holy Spirit. You have a revival amongst God's people and effectively a new people. And you have a new priest that really gets it done. That is what makes the new covenant new. Now, as we draw this to a close, look at Roman numeral three there, the key implications. The key implications is simple. The new covenant is better. I want you to notice point A there. This is our theme of our whole class, our whole Bible study. The covenant that Christ mediates is better, verse 6. It's better for all those reasons. You have a new power because of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, a revival amongst God's people, and a priest that really gets it done. And therefore, the big conclusion, verse 13, the Old, Testament's, the Old Covenant is obsolete. Obsolete is a key word here. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say the Old Covenant is sinful. He doesn't say it's wrong. He doesn't say it's contradictory to it. He says it's obsolete. It's been completed and fulfilled and surpassed. The analogy I gave you last week for this, I repeat here, and this is the way to think about this relationship is the difference between a blueprint and the actual house. If you've ever lived, if you've ever built a house, you know that you looked over those blueprints carefully, right? You mapped out every room and the kitchen and the bathroom and the master suite. You had the whole thing all mapped out. And you looked at those blueprints. You maybe spent time looking and, and sort of digesting those blueprints. But when the house was built, how much do you think about the blueprints anymore? It's stuffed in a closet. Why? Because you, now you don't have to look at your kitchen on paper. You can stand in it. You don't have to imagine what your master bedroom was like. You can sleep in it. This is the relationship between the old covenant and the new. It's obsolete, not because it's wrong, because it's been fulfilled. By the way, the relationship between blueprints and the house is not contradictory, right? They better agree or you're going to fire your contractor, right? The blueprints and the house agree with each other, but you can't live in blueprints. But you can live in a house. That is the summation of this whole passage. The great and glorious thing about the new covenant is the final complete, and now the old covenant is obsolete. And how does that feed into the theme of Hebrews? Simple. Don't go back. Don't go back to the old ways. Don't go back and try to live in the blueprint. You have the real thing in Christ. Now, I told you today would be thick. 
I've put a lot on you here. I've got a lot of it in your notes. You can go back and review. Um, even gone a little over the normal time I try to end. But there's a lot of wonderful things here. And hopefully this is a bit of a, a lesson, right, of the thickness and the meat of this whole covenant idea. There's some great takeaways here today. And I know you'll process those even more in your groups. Let's transition to that. And let me pray for us as we do. And we can go deeper in these times. And as you go into the group time, what I really want you to focus on is, is, is and the questions will help you get there, is how do you avoid the externals of law keeping like the old covenant and really start obeying the law on the internals like the new. All right, let me pray for us. Lord, we're grateful for this word. It's a lot to think about, but Lord, so good, so glorious. Lord, help us as we process these in the groups, Lord, just to impress upon us that we have the end of the ages on us. What a glorious privilege it is to be in the new covenant. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.